Empirical provide compelling, interactive learning across a range of delivery options. Live on site, live online or online anytime, we have a training course that is ideal for you. For a no-obligations chat about your training requirements, contact us at empirical.com. In this session, we're going to look at the fundamentals of real-time communications. And there's four parts to this session. We'll begin with just looking at some general concepts, and then we'll move on to the specifics of voice services, video services, and messaging. So generally speaking, the real-time services that we do discuss relative to RCS are a telephony service, a voice service, a video service, and a messaging service. But under those high-level category names, there are actually several different instances of those services. So we will tackle each one in turn, and we'll begin with looking at the details of the IP voice service. Now, there are various flavours of this voice service and the determining factor is essentially what kind of access network are we using in order to access the service. So overall we call it the voice service but in actual fact if we were for example using 2G or 3G as an access network then we'd be using circuit switch voice. If we're on 4G LTE well in that case it would be Volti IR92. If we are using HSPA and we can have a voice service over HSPA, well, we'll be using voice over HSPA or IR58. And finally, there will be the scenario where we are not on a 3GPP access network. And in that case, it's still an IMS based system. And Despite the fact that we've got no 3GPP call capability, we will still be establishing the call using the IP multimedia subsystem. So there are distinct terms for each of these voice service types. So we see the likes of RCSCS, RCSLTE, RCSHSPA, and RCSAA, with AA standing for access agnostic. And a typical example of access agnostic would be using a Wi-Fi network to access the voice service. So in the case of LTE, HSPA, and no 3GPP call capability, all of those procedures would be IMS based. In fact, they're all based largely on IR92 Volti, but obviously, in some cases, the access network won't be LTE. Circuit switch voice is based on regular 2G or 3G circuit switch voice call establishment. So we can look at a basic procedure. Now, this basic procedure that we have is relative to the IMS systems. So LTE, HSPA, and access agnostic. These will all use this flow of events in order to establish a typical voice call. And you can see the main IMS entities that we have here are the proxy call session control function. So this is the first point of contact that our signaling hits as we reach the IMS. We've got the serving call session control function in the IMS. And this is looking after our service control. As a subscriber sends requests for services to the IMS, it's the serving call session control function that will deal with those service requests. And then we've got a couple of application servers. We've got the service centralization and continuity application server. And this is dealing with services such as single radio voice call continuity. But it's also anchoring the service, the voice service, in the IMS, despite the fact that we might be using circuit switched access. We've also got the TAS, the telephony application server. And this is there to assist with supplementary services. So as you may appreciate, if we are providing a voice service in RCS, it needs to come with the supplementary services that any voice service would be expected to have. So it's the TAS that will be there to implement those supplementary services. So when I initiate a call, signaling leaves the handset and flows across the access network. We said that could be LTE, it could be HSPA, or it could be something like Wi-Fi. 
All of those access networks are IP networks. They allow me to get my request for a service up to the proxy call session control function. The proxy will get that signaling off to the serving, and the serving will analyze that signaling to say, what is this subscriber trying to do? In turn, the serving will send the signaling on to the SCC application server to check whether or not the called party actually needs to be contacted in the packet switched or the circuit switched domain. And that's part of the centralization role of the SCC application server. So we check how the call needs to be terminated. In this call, let's say we're going to use packet switch termination. We also check whether or not any supplementary services need to be implemented as well. Once that's done, we can contact the called party itself. And the whole point of this signaling exchange is to ultimately establish bidirectional voice packets. So there will be signaling messages flowing back and forth across the network, ultimately to establish this end-to-end -end voice bearer to exchange voice packets. So that's the basics of voice. If we turn our attention to video, well, there are several different approaches in terms of how we might initiate the video calling process. Now, for the most part, the IP video service is based on IR94, which is also termed VILTE, video over LTE. But again, the same applies. Sometimes we might not be using an LTE access network. And as such, although the video service is based on IR94, there will be exceptions when we're accessing the network using Wi-Fi, for example. So there are different ways to actually implement the service or initiate the service. It could be direct launch, and with direct launch, there is zero communication taking place. And from the outset, we establish an, a voice and video call with the called party. You could get the situation where it's an upgrade. So we have a voice over IP call already taking place. And what we do is we upgrade that call to include a video stream as well. And then the final option is a replacement. And this essentially means that we've got a call ongoing, but it's in the circuit switch domain. And as such, we replace that circuit switch voice call with a video call, which is essentially more or less the same as, as direct launch. Because what we do is we terminate the circuit switch call and actually initiate a new video call. So again, if we take a look at the basic procedure, it's actually the same as voice. The only difference being is, of course, it is end-to-end -end communication, but the point is we need to set up two separate bearers now, one for the voice packets and one for the video packets. But ultimately, the end-to-end -end flow of signaling is pretty much identical. The final service that we have to consider is messaging. And messaging can still be considered to be a real-time service. Now, there's three different kinds of messaging that might be encountered. First of all, we've got standalone messaging. And standalone messaging is the kind of replacement to what we expect when we look at services like SMS or MMS. So it's a standalone messaging service where we've got a customer who just wants to send a text or send a photo or whatever. They're not expecting to engage in any kind of chat session with the person that they are sending the message to. It's just kind of a one-off event. So that will be called standalone messaging. But then we have one-to-one -one chat, and that's the next step forward, where we are engaging in an instant messaging session with another user of the RCS messaging service. And then finally, the next extension to one-to-one -one chat is group chat. So we have a multi-party chat session where everyone is exchanging messages and everyone is seeing the entire set of messages being exchanged within the chat session. And there are different ways to implement these particular services. So with standalone messaging, it is largely based on the Open Mobile Alliance converged IP messaging standard. Whereas conversely, one-to-one -one chat and group chat, they can also be based on OMA CPM, but they might also use OMA Simple. 
simple standing for SIP for instant messaging and presence leveraging extensions. Now in actual fact, OMA CPM and OMA Simple have some close similarities anyway. So there are different ways to implement the various messaging services in RCS. Now if we just focus on standalone messaging, what does standalone messaging actually offer as a service? Well here's some service features. So we've got the typical text and multimedia messaging exchange capability. So that's a given, that's what you would expect from a standalone messaging service. There's also delivery and display notification, so we know if the message has got to the other side, and we know whether or not the message has actually been displayed on the handset. We can provide support for multiple devices, and this is in relation to the fact that we're using an IMS network for message exchange. And we can support this messaging service on several devices simultaneously. We've got deferred messaging, so if we're not able to send the message for whatever reason, it can be stored in the network and sent later. We've also got a common message store. And again, if we are using multiple devices, instead of having copies of the same chat sessions and such like within each handset or each device, we've actually got a common centralized message store in the network which holds all of the messaging information history. And then finally, we've got interworking with legacy and SMS MMS. So there are interworking functions in the network. So if we do need to send messaging to these legacy networks, that's a possibility. Now with standalone messaging, there's essentially two modes of operation. The first mode is pager mode, and this is a typical message exchange. It's actually the SIP message method that's used. And it's simply a SIP message which carries whatever message as a payload and the 200 OK to confirm receipt. And you can see in the middle, we've got the call session control function coordinating that end-to-end -end delivery. Now this pager mode operation is OK if messages are not over 1300 bytes. If they are over 1300 bytes, we need to use large message mode. And when we use large message mode, this is when we need to utilize a protocol called message session relay protocol. So SIP is still used, as you can see from the diagram. A SIP invite procedure is actually used to establish an MSRP session. And within that MSRP session, we can then send those bigger messages. So just in summary then, what we covered in this session. We talked about RCS voice services and there are a variety of different mechanisms which allow us to offer that voice service. And they are determined, or the choice of which, is determined by whichever access network we happen to be using. So if it's LTE, we're going to be using Volte. If it's H HSPA, well, we'll use voice over HSPA. We could be using general IMS, so if it's an access agnostic approach where we're using something like Wi-Fi to provide us connectivity, it would be general IMS procedures. But we could be using the circuit switch domain as well. We talked about video, we said this is a hybrid service really to voice, the establishment process looks very, very similar. And finally we looked at messaging. And in terms of messaging, there are three different techniques. Standalone, which is similar to traditional SMS and MMS. We've also got one-to-one -one messaging, where we set up a chat session. And we've got group chat, where we will participate in a chat session with multiple different RCS users. Need to know more? Why not visit our store, where you can choose from over 200 hours of video-based training. Alternatively, you can contact us to discuss any specific training requirements you may have.